don't have a title slide, and as she said, the topic of my presentation is Peaceful Animals, a look into black pacifism and the pedagogy of civil rights in American public education. Let's get into it. So is everyone familiar with the concept of an epigraph? It's the short quote or passage at the front of a novel or book to uh, convey a theme or set a tone. Um, and while I may be mixing mediums here, I have an epigraph for my speech here. Would one not say, on seeing what takes place in this world, that the European is to men of other races what man himself is to animals? Alexis de Tocqueville, 1835. And with that in mind, I'd like to give a comprehensive history of the civil rights movement. <laughs> Martin Luther King campaigned nobly, promoting peace and nonviolence. He had a friend, Rosa Parks, who took a seat on the bus and refused to give it up. Together they walked through the streets, never raising a fist, and there was also a guy, Malcolm X, he was kind of like King, but he was violent. And then somebody shot King in the neck, and that was it. Movement over, goal achieved. Your skin color was not a thing of note until a black man entered office in 2008. This oversimplification reflects the entirety, and in some cases more than the entirety, of the knowledge to impart to many of those who experience the United States public education system. United States history education, in a word, is lacking. There are, yes, very lacking. <laughs> That's not my favorite. Yes, very much so. Fun fact, suspenders are great at holding papers. One second. Now, very, very, very lacking. Oh my god, it's, it's really something, isn't it? Okay, so, let's see here. Now, there is a major issue in how we as a society remember our complex past of racism. If we really dive into the history standards for American public education, we can see that the narratives that are in place have been structured in a manner that by way of purposeful omission and harmful misinterpretation, promote the passivity and pacifism of the black race. Now today I'll be discussing a few key topics. Initially, we're gonna look at the foundations, the historical foundations of the miseducation of black individuals in America. Then I'll be moving to some discerning examples put in place by educational bodies of blatant error of teaching history. And then lastly, I'll be talking about the harm in our current understanding given to us by the history standards around certain figures in black history, namely Rosa Parks, MLK, and Malcolm X. This next slide is just, oh, that's not what I thought it was. Now we move on. <laughs> now, generous, generously, the relationship of the powers that be of America and black education can best be described as tenuous. Stories of groups that America continues to marginalize seldom see the front seat in the classroom. Obtaining accurate and comprehensive information is something about the black condition, is something that people must explicitly elect to partake in. And this contemporary self-taught requirement for knowledge acquisition has direct parallels to American slavery. It should come as no surprise to anybody that, of course, society seldom provided enslaved blacks with the means to an education. If we look to Frederick Douglass, the, uh, the escaped slave, uh, as he said in his autobiography, he has the quotes, the more I read, the more I was led to abhor and detest my enslavers. This quote is emblematic of a very large idea. In the, in the slave era of slavery, we could see so many laws and statutes like those passed in 1830 North Carolina that made education of blacks a harshly punishable crime and all the other barriers in place. It was always an uphill battle for blacks to gain literacy and education. So we can take this Frederick Douglass quote to be emblematic of a underlying thematic subtext in American history, which is a fear by the white majority and white society of a perhaps justifiable backlash from those groups that are marginalized and brutalized. And that fear is not without basis, because by affording knowledge and context to the oppressed, the oppressor stands to lose their status as such. If we follow Douglas's story and his continued secret education, eventual liberation, 
and coalescence into the abolition movement, we can understand that by affording context, an individual can become one of the single most influential people in the, gar in the struggle for liberation, not to mention all of his other socio-political achievements. Now, I contend while at times perhaps more indirectly, the same logic of attempting to prevent political action is what we see in our classrooms today. Now, if we go to a Malcolm X quote, he articulated a problem that we see in our current society. The average amount of knowledge, that is not the quote from Malcolm X. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that momentarily. Now, if we look to the education on this very topic, the topic of American slavery, the dehumanizing institution, we can see the example, uh, the first hint of the problem of which I speak. Now, coming to that Malcolm X quote, which I do not have a slide for, apparently, <laughs> he discusses the idea of the amount of knowledge that the average black person of his time possessed, and he balked at the historical inaccuracies, inaccuracies that they possessed. He claimed it to be unbelievable how many black men and women have been led to believe a almost romantic idea of what slave days were like. In past pedag pedagogies, it was the case that black, uh, that slavery was approached to be a mutually beneficial topic. In return for free labor, slaves were provided with adequate food and shelter. And now, fortunately, in the current pedagogy, we can see that this frame is not the standard that is pushed out, but denial of the brutalities experienced during slavery is not a relic of the past. And I have here some egregious, particularly egregious, egregious examples of what we can still see in our current society. Now on the right here, my, on the left here, we have a quote from a 1954 Texas history textbook, a textbook that was lambasted by scholars from a variety of sources, including an individual from this very university, Texas A&M, as being full of inaccuracies and promoting racist ideology. And on the left here, we have a quote from Patricia Hardy, who in 2010, a then current and a then uh, and current Texas school board member, both of these quotes conveying similar ideas, relegating slavery's role in the Civil War to a near immaterial role. Additionally, if we look to this published, uh, as reported on by the New York Times in 2015, by McGraw Hill, the third biggest. U.S. textbook publishing company, in which it claims that the Atlantic slave trade brought millions of workers from Africa to work on agricultural plantations. Framing slaves as African workers is really an interesting way of putting it. <laughs> now, more interestingly than all that, we have this example from South Carolina. Now, South Carolina, on their official uh, State Department website, they have lesson plans put in place to discuss certain topics. One of those topics being the Stono Rebellion, which was one of the largest and earliest slave rebellions in the British colonial period. And the way that they breach this topic, they have a series of guiding questions for discussion. <coughs> those three questions are as follows. What happens to people when they misbehave at school? What happens to people who break the law? What happened to the slaves who were involved in the rebellion? This framing sets up those black individuals who fought for their liberation and compares them to children misbehaving or criminals breaking the law. With all of these examples, we see a massive problem. If we downplay the brutality of slavery, we have no idea of the scope of suffering it makes us more likely to dismiss the continuing afterlives of the time period where we treated black people worse than animals in this dehumanizing institution. Now, I mentioned Patricia Hardy earlier as a member of the Texas Board of Education. And if we look at, the reason she made that comment was because the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, the text that uh, all of our education standards are based off of, uh, were recently revised in 2010, which prompted her to make that lovely quote. And 
if we look into the actual text of the text, we can find a lot of problems. Now, within uh, the Texas market for textbook is almost unequivocally large. So anything that is involved in the text is important for the rest of the country. So if we go into what is actually in the text, we can see that while the Ku, the Ku Klux Klan and Jim Crow received no mention, again, dismissing a great deal of brutality experienced by black Americans, we do of course see the mention of Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, and rightfully so. Their contribution towards black liberation is incredible and does, certainly deserves mention within our educational standards. However, the way that King and Parks are broached within the text and within our current collective consciousness serves as a means to pacify black Americans. Now, I did not say police practice, which is <laughs> the reasoning behind my currently shuffling of the papers. <laughs> now, but if we were to really, is this, I should have numbered these, okay. This is the back of that, and then, okay, I found it. So, <laughs> now, our current collective consciousness greatly downplays the radicalism of King and Rosa Parks. To focus on Parks, in popular legend, we largely see her as a tired old seamstress who on the spur of the moment, decided to sit down after a long day's work. However, the reality of the situation, as recounted by numerous stories, including Parks' own autobiography, My Story, is that the move came as a result um, of a massive, calculated effort on the part of, do of veteran activists. The removal from our shared memory of the careful and calculated effort to dismantle Jim Crow sells short the scale of the effort required to uproot institutional boundaries. The false narrative of she was tired, so she sat, cause and effect, ignores the radical line of thinking that is openly and actively defying American racism. The simplification of Parks' actions does not create an environment that is inherently conducive to the radical school of thought which she exemplified. Additionally, if we look at the pacified version of King provided to Americans, it allows for the bastardization of his beliefs to combat current social and political movements. The evocation of King is often used to disprove a riots that come as a result of police brutality. His words are used to haphazardly fit whatever narrative is convenient. But Dr. King's vocabulary was not limited to, to the four-word phrase, I have a dream. There are so many layers of complexity to King that are ignored within the current collective consciousness. The pacified version of King is then in turn to try to pacify black people, bearing in no mind claims made by Dr. King that were complicated and uh, like the one given in 1966, that he, where he stated in the CBS interview, I think that we've got to see the, that a riot is the language of the young herd. And to label King as strictly nonviolent is somewhat of a misnomer itself. Now, don't get me wrong, the rhetoric of King was very deliberate, but you cannot divorce racism and violence. King and his followers employed a very disciplined self-sacrifice of the black body. The violence was there, it was simply not directed towards white bodies or white property. We are shown King because he is easier to digest. His general message of nonviolence is malleable. Despite his desire to expose the grave injustice of racism, the pared down version of King does not force us as a collective to deeply explore the gravity and injustices placed against black. The torrent of the fire hose, while shocking and horrific, still rests easier on our minds than the state-sponsored murder of Black Panther captains. Now, on the note of Black Panthers, excuse me for the time, I don't, yeah. Okay, so, on the topic of Black Panther captains, the text does briefly mention the Black Panther Party, but only explicitly in contrasting their release with King's nonviolent methods. The name Malcolm X is nowhere to be found. And I cannot do justice to fully describe the complexities, triumphs, and faults of both the Black Panther Party and Malcolm X and his ever-evolving racial beliefs in the time that I have, seeing as I'm already going over by a lot. But so much of the basic ideology of black power and Malcolm X's line of thinking is that it's simply contingent on doing what could be done to prevent black bodies from being brutalized and murdered for the sake of progress. 
to only classify their actions and beliefs as violent is wildly inaccurate and harmful. There is a the more direct and blunt approach of X, and similarly the Panthers, presents a perspective that cannot be afforded to be absent from education standards. And as I looked further into the Texas guidelines and other curriculums, the rhetoric of what has selectively been chosen to be praised and condemned, while not surprising, is incredibly problematic. In America, passivity and pacifism are standards that are disproportionately held to black bodies. This is a point that Malcolm X articulated to an LA crowd in 1962. The white man is tricking you. He is trapping you. He doesn't call it violence when he lands troops in South Vietnam. He doesn't call it violence when he lands troops in Berlin. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, he didn't say get non-violent. He said praise the Lord, but pass the ammunition. Fred Hampton, the 21-year-old Black Panther captain, who many said was on his way to becoming an inf as influential as X or King, were he not assassinated by the FBI. Robert F. Williams, author of the important book, Negroes with Guns, which showcased the utter racial war zone that was 1950s Monroe, North Carolina. And Asana Shakur, this controversial fugitive and activist who experienced profoundly inhuman treatment while in detention centers. None of these people, X included are seen within the Texas Central Knowledge and Skills, the AP US History Guidelines, or Common Core Standards. And it is understandable that not every key figure from history can be mentioned in a school year. And this problem of erasure or lack of exposure is not unique to the black community. But to have this issue so intimate to the American fabric, to have this issue, this perspective of black power can near completely ignored is a disservice to all of us. This country is deeply, deeply scarred. To protect this country's sense of self, it is imperative that revolutionaries and radicals do not present evidence of this nation's past sins and current imperfections. From our education standards and our warping of our radicals, Hartz and King included, it is apparent that we do not like it when black people are not passive and complicit in our oppression. In a country that has asserted that black people are animals, that must remain peaceful at all times. It is our duty to actively reject this notion. So we come to the question, the question that Dred Scott had to ask when the Supreme Court of these United States claimed that no Negro, enslaved or otherwise, could be a citizen of this country. That question being, am I not a man? It's the question that Sojourner Truth asked in that Ohio town in 1851. Ain't I a woman? We are not boys, we are not cargo, we are not animals. We are men, we are women, we are non-binary conforming citizens of these united, divided states, and in every facet that racism infects this country, we demand better for those of us who come after. And education is the focal point of all of this. It is the basis from which we build our society. The system does what it can to keep the slave from literacy. And while there are subjective flaws in both the ideology of King and that of X, only providing a simplified version of one side of the crusade for justice and equality works to pacify the marginalized. Without proper education, we keep the black and brown youth from the right tools to contextualize and fight against the contemporary manifestations of racism. We keep members of the unafflicted group away from understanding. Public history education is a complete overhaul. We need to allot more time to focus on the valid duality of the struggle for black liberation. And in doing so, hopefully the epigraphs for the books to be written about the time we live in now can reflect a brighter theme. Thank you.